all of my heart. But there's someone who has torn it apart, and she's taken just all that I have. If you wanna try to love again, well, baby, I try to love again, but I don't. Deepest. Well, baby, I know the first cut is the deepest. I have the honor of introducing our next speaker, uh, Dr. Angela Schlegier. She's a doctor of, uh, she is a doctor of podiatry medicine and has been treating wounds since 2003. She is the owner and podiatrist of Edel Weiss Podiatry in Fredericksburg, Texas. Her past work history includes working for the Podiatry Group of South Texas and being on the medical staff for the Hyperbaric Medicine and Wound Care at Fort Duncan Regional Medical Center. She's a certified wound specialist, CWS, from the American Academy of Wound Management. She's also a local and she's uh, attended uh, Shriner University and also trained here at, uh, through the VA. And uh, she practices in Fredericksburg currently. So let's give a welcome to Dr. Shabir. Okay. Yeah, I grew up in Ingram. That's where I graduated from. Then I went to Shriner, so no Ingram jokes. And, um, and I did train in the VA, but I was in Chicago, South Dakota, Arizona, and I did some training in Autumn Murphy also. So it's kind of nice to be back home talking about this stuff. Um, I deal a lot with diabetic foot ulcers, and so a lot of these ulcers are preventable. So that's kind of where my talk is leading is more, how can we catch these people before they ulcerate and fix the problem, offload the area that will ulcerate, and help these people to get on with their lives. So you know, I've been talking about the different types of ulcers. We have neuropathic, arterial, venous. All of these ulcers happen in the foot. Um, venous, not nearly as frequently, but they do happen. Um, the main ulcer that we see is neuropathic. These are the ones that we can really prevent early. And so 60 to 70% of all of our, uh, our diabetics will develop neuropathy. Um, one study showed that 7% of our diabetics on diagnosis of diabetes already have neuropathy. So what's important about that, as soon as they have their diagnosis of diabetes, they should initiate regular diabetic foot exams at that time. It's better if these people come in to see us early rather than having diabetes for 10, 15 years and now we're you know, just starting our podiatric foot exams. Um, we can prevent a lot of problems if we can see these people early. So clinically, we call it protective sensation because if they step on a tack, will they feel it? If they have a sticker in their shoe, are they going to feel it or are they going to notice at the end of the day when they take their shoes off that their, their shoe is full of blood or maybe they notice blood in the floorboard of their car? That's how they first notice the ulcer because they just can't feel anything on their foot. And so we test this with a monofilament. Can you pass out monofilaments? I brought some uh, show and tell since we're right before lunch to keep y'all interested. So we use a monofilament. Um, we test different points on the foot. They should be able to feel this. If they cannot feel this, that's a big indication that they're not going to feel that tack that's in their shoe. Um, so when they, when the skin is injured, or even, you know, it doesn't have to be a, a foreign body that's attacking the foot. It can just be a callus. On a sensate foot, a callus will be very painful. And so these people develop calluses, which are really a pre-ulcerative lesion, and they really don't feel pain where they should. When you don't feel pain, you know when you buy a new pair of shoes and they just don't fit right, and you get blisters, and everybody talks about breaking in your shoes, and they'll get more comfortable? So if you have feeling in your feet, you'll eventually probably stop wearing those shoes because they hurt your feet. And diabetic, they don't stop wearing those shoes because their feet don't hurt. Nothing that happens causes pain. So their gait cycle is altered, their um, musculature is changed, they develop arthritis, they walk differently, but they don't really notice what's happening because they're pain-free. So it's kind of a blessing to be pain-free, but at the same time it's a curse. So <clears throat> when you see this on a patient's foot, 
And you know, y'all see this a lot more than we do because you're in there with these people, you're talking to them. So when uh, skin exams are, are done, calluses are a lot of times just looked over. But this is a pre-ulcerative lesion. So imagine a really nice uh, green lawn. And if you take a piece of plywood, put it out on the green lawn, leave it there for about two to three weeks, when you remove that, what happens? Good. The grass is yellow, it's dead. Imagine that a callus is doing the same thing to the skin. It's, there's friction in this area, there's pressure, oh, whoops. There's friction, pressure, the skin underneath this callus is dying. So we need to remove that callus and find a way to prevent the callus from coming back. <clears throat> and so neuropathic ulcers, the key signs, you're going to notice um, the hyperkeratotic ring. They will always have this hyperkeratotic ring. And that's because this, this was a callus to start with. And if we can catch it at that point, we can prevent this. And so this ring that's right here, it continues <laughs> to cause problems with the skin. And this wound will not heal until all of this is debrided. And so that's why we really rely on heavy debridement. These really are typically debrided once a week. If we can do that, offload this, then we can help that skin to heal. It's never going to be as strong as the original skin. If we can prevent it from ever happening, at least they retain their planar skin. Another common place on the great toe is uh, that when, during toe off, there's just a lot of pressure. And when people have an altered gait cycle, there's even more pressure. And so this is a very common area. And this is the one that I noticed that, and maybe Dr. Brooks will notice this too, this is the one people pick at. You know, they're, as they're showing it to you, they're pulling and yanking and it starts bleeding. That's a really important thing to let the patients know. Don't pick at anything on your foot because that skin is already dying under there. They're pulling it off. They don't feel that it's hurting. And now we have a new hole to deal with in their foot. Many of the, the lesions we can offload to breed, get them healed up, get them into a good pair of shoes, and we're okay. When we also have an arterial component, there are bigger issues. And I went to a, a dinner last night where they cited a research study citing 50% of all neuropathic ulcers are also have an arterial component. So these people really should be involved with the vascular surgeon also. We can offload, we can use all of our fancy uh, wound treatments, but if they don't have the circulation, it won't heal. Okay, so, and this is an example of that. I see a lot of ulcers that come in and people have treated them. You know, if you look at the, the method of treatment, everything's gone very well. They've had really good uh, infection control, they've had offloading, everything has gone very well, except that this is not a neuropathic ulcer, this is an arterial ulcer. So as we debride, this ulcer is going to get larger and larger and larger, and we're not going anywhere. So this person needs to see a vascular surgeon if you're going to save this foot. And that's, you know, um, I don't know how, or how many of y'all work with home health? Okay, and how many of y'all work in a, like a skilled nursing facility? Okay, and the rest of y'all are hospital based? Okay. So sometimes um, I have, I've talked to people that work in home health and nursing facilities where they'll just get an order for wound care. There's no specific order for what type of wound care, what product, how to offload or anything. And so it really is important that y'all are coming to these courses and learning all these things because this is not a neuropathic ulcer, this is arterial. This person needs to see a vascular surgeon. And so y'all see these things so much more than we do because y'all are changing the dressings. We really rely on y'all to give us a call and say, hey, this doesn't look so good. And so noticing that this is arterial is key for this patient saving this limb. Okay, so I want to talk about just basic foot deformities. These are the kind of foot deformities that we can correct early on and save this patient a lot of trouble, save um, amputations, just save everything all the way around. And with Medicare, um, how many of y'all work here in the VA? Okay. What we're dealing with with Medicare on the outside, everything is going for pay for performance. So what is coming down the pipe is you will receive a set number of dollars and you have a set number of days to heal this wound. If you don't have that healed in that time, then that you have to continue taking care of the patient at your own expense. And so 
One of the things that we can really do, when we see a foot like this, this patient is neuropathic, this patient is diabetic, they will ulcerate at some time. So while this patient is younger, healthier, glucose is more well controlled, um, maybe they're a little bit more compliant, we can repair these toes so that we don't have these pressure points. If we do that at this time, when they have the circulation to heal the surgery, then we, we have potentially prevented an amputation 15 years down the road, okay? With a hammer toe, you'll notice that the tendons are very tight. There may or may not be a corn on the top of the toe. This is a site for ulceration on the top of the toe. Sometimes the fifth toe will be rotated, and you can see where the, the skin is a little bit darker, there's a little bit of callus, these are all pre-ulcerative lesions in a diabetic or a neuropathic patient. Now, there's also pressure at the tips of the toes because they are no longer walking on a flat surface. The tip of the toe is pounding into the, the shoe or the ground every step they take. And since we live in Tecla, Texas, everyone's wearing flip-flops, and so it's even worse. And then the, so here are some examples. A normal callus is kind of yellow. When your callus starts turning red, brown, starts turning darker colors, there's actually micro bleeding underneath the callus. That's the skin dying underneath the callus. That's a big concern. Most people are not going to see this as a concern until they see, you know, a big red open wound and something more exaggerated. Kind of like the spider bite. It looks like a little spider bite, so it doesn't really seem that important. They don't realize that there's, it's not a spider bite. There's, some, there's a much bigger problem. It's the same thing with these types of little lesions. It doesn't look very important, but it really is. They also will get ulcers between the toes. Um, these are a big problem for offloading because until that hammer toe is repaired, you're not going to ever be able to keep that ulcer away. We can pad it, we can do different things, but when this person's circulation goes down, this is going to be the cause of the loss of that toe, if not part of the foot. And the toe is very swollen here. Typically, when you have this much swelling, there's also bone involvement as far as osteomyelitis. Hammer toes also cause pressure underneath the metatarsal heads. And so this toe is just almost dislocated on top of the metatarsal. Can you pass out the foot models? I'm like a magic show. I've got a whole box of tricks here for you. <laughs> And so if you look at the way the bones are shaped on the, on the foot, look at the toes. Now imagine that the toe is sitting up on top of that long metatarsal. So what it's doing is pounding the metatarsal into the ground. It's literally boring a hole through the skin to the ground. So if we catch this person early on, we correct their hammer toe. And most of the time when we do surgery, we um, address the deformity at the joint, not just the toe, so we don't have these high pressure points underneath the foot. These are really, really common sites for ulceration. But when we've encountered this patient, they've already got vascular disease, you know, there's really a limited amount that we can do. Okay, bunions. Um, every, every, just about every patient will tell you, oh, that's just my bunion. And that's the way they put it, that's just my bunion. Well, it's a high pressure point. When these bones move out of, uh, out of alignment, they you know, create a pokeyati spot on the foot, and any pokeyati spot on the, on the foot is gonna create an ulcer and uh, can lead to amputation. And underneath the first metatarsal head, I don't think these models have it, there are two little bones that are there that create a lot of additional pressure called the sesamoids. And so many times we have sesamoid problems in these types of ulcers. And so we can heal this ulcer, and this will be a really recurrent ulcer. We'll get it healed, they get diabetic shoes, the ulcer comes back. We get it healed, and we keep going through this process until they eventually end up with osteomyelitis and we have to amputate. So if we can correct the deformity early on, this is another case where we can save this foot. Um, great toe lesions, I see a whole lot of these, and unfortunately, by the time I see them, they nearly always have a vascular component. And so when we go through a normal gait cycle, we go through toe off. A lot of patients, I don't know if, if you all hear this, people say, well, I'm wearing out the heel of my shoe. I don't know why, but I'm putting my heel first. Well, that's a normal gait cycle. People seem to think that they should walk on their toe first and kind of bounce off their toes. 
In a normal gait cycle, they should have heel strike first, they should roll across the midfoot, that's the stance phase, and then they should toe off. Now this great toe joint, so your big toe joint should have quite a bit of motion there so you can toe off. What's happening with these people, they have a little bit of arthritis, some spurring in this joint, so they have almost no motion. So when they toe off, there's just a lot of pressure on this toe. This is a really easy deformity to fix early on, but they, they, these are the people that will have just a little callus. It's not very big. So when you're doing a foot exam, you should notice on the big toe, is there a little callus right here? If there's a little callus right here, this is the, what this patient could potentially have happen. And that's a really easy fix. <clears throat> Other foot deformities, um, Charcot foot, that one is, is a bear to deal with because there's just really not many good ways to offload that. And there are surgical corrections for this, but not everyone is a candidate. And so um, these kind of lesions are very, very chronic. These people become very depressed because you're basically taking them off their foot and telling them, you have to do nothing now. And this is going to take months and months and months. So the biggest key with a Charcot foot is recognizing Charcot in the acute phase. If you can catch a Charcot foot before it collapses, you can save this foot. I don't know exactly, I read an article and I don't remember the exact percentage, but there's a very high percentage of Charcot foot that go on to amputation. There's a high rate of osteomyelitis in these patients. Now, as surgeons, you know, we try and save as much as we can. So people come into the ER and um, depending on what hospital you're at, you might, the vascular surgeon might do this, the general surgeon or the podiatrist. And so some of the thought process is, let's see how much of this foot we can save. But in the end, we're not doing the patient any favors by saving this. And so when we see a patient that has a foot structure like this, it's completely biomechanically unstable. They will ulcerate here, they will ulcerate underneath this metatarsal head, but the scary part about this, during this phase, we've been able to save most of the foot. If it gets infected again, we may not be able to save that much of the foot. So when I see a patient that has had this type of a, a surgery where the majority of the forefoot is gone, I will take that person, even if they don't have an open lesion, take them to surgery and go ahead and amputate right here and create a stable walking surface. So we can save these feet, we just have to do it preventatively. So offloading, um, there's a lot of different ways to offload. I'm sorry, can you uh, <coughs> mention the charcoal foot? Can you kind of elaborate? I mean, what is it? I'm going, I, okay. you're, it's okay, you're right ahead of me. <laughs> so, okay, so offloading, they've come up with all these different devices to offload. The biggest thing is we send them out of the wound clinic, you know, with one of these, and we've removed our pegs and everything looks hunky-dory and happy. And then the next time you see them, they come in and they're wearing this, but it's bright and shiny and clean and looks like it's never been worn, but they swear they've been wearing it. And then their wound has a large callus around it. So we know that they're not wearing it. And so compliance is key with offloading. If they're not being compliant, you're just going nowhere in a hurry. And with those patients, um, I do a lot of education with the patients and the home health nurses that I work with, they do a lot of education also. You know, they'll walk in and they'll give me a call and say, you know, um, like they just called me this week, your patient is supposed to be strict non-weight bearing and He's out in his garden with his flip-flops on, with his wound back on, with his walker, walking through the garden. And so, you know, those people, we can try very hard. We can use all of our, everything in our tool chest, but, you know, walking in the garden on a planter wound that has a wound back on, when you're supposed to be completely non-weight bearing, we just, there's nothing we can do about that. So as much as we try, we have offloading products, but we have to get the patients to use them. Um, I like these because I will tell the patients to save them because we can put these little pegs back in and then when they develop another wound, which the majority of people that have a diabetic ulcer will ulcer it again, we can put these pegs back in and offload where we need to. And yet, for my indigent patients, I don't know how many of y'all deal with those, 
but um, a lot of the, the thrift stores, the hospice stores, things like that, people donate these. And so I uh, talk to them and they'll, they can't resell them because it's a medical device. So I will talk to them and say, can you save anything that comes through, through like this and we can get those to our indigent patients. Um, custom molded shoes, those are, you know, once a patient has had an ulcer, they don't need a regular diabetic shoe. More likely than not, they need a custom molded shoe. These um, are not, you don't come by them very frequently. The medical supply companies that do diabetic shoes typically do not do custom molded shoes. And so what we see with this, the difference between this and a diabetic shoe, can you pass around the brown shoes? If you look at the shape of the bottom of the shoe, it's not the shape of a normal shoe. And the reason it's not is that we actually take a mold of the patient's entire foot all the way up to the ankle. And then this shoe is built around that mold. And so when we have this recurrent ulcer that just keeps ulcerating, we need to go ahead and do a custom shoe. That's really the best way to offload. Now, if you have somebody that has pre-ulcerative lesions, they have hammer toes, they have bunions, we can go with a regular diabetic shoe. And we have some of those. And you know, the, the biggest problem with diabetic shoes, especially if you talk to our older women, they're like, it looks like a Frankenstein shoe. And they're not interested, they're not gonna wear it. So I brought some shoes, because y'all see a lot of these people, y'all can let them know. You know, the more people they hear this from, you know, it's a diabetic shoe, but they don't look like Frankenstein shoes anymore. So I brought some examples of, you know, what some of the nicer diabetic shoes look like. So we can get more compliance out of that. Can you hold up the one that's, kind of, I think it's on the bottom, that's kind of cute, it's brown. I mean, that doesn't really look that much like a diabetic shoe. And so in our little older ladies that want to make sure that they can wear something to church, and it goes nicely with their slides, they're not going to wear the Frankenstein shoe. They're, they will wear that. Okay. These shoes are deeper than your average shoe. Um, there's different types of inserts that go into these shoes. There's a heat moldable shoe insert, and then there's a custom molded shoe insert. The biggest headache after getting a, an ulcer healed and we've gotten all the infection controlled, this patient is ready to go out and start walking again. They go get diabetic shoes somewhere, and they come back, and they have ulcers on their feet from the shoes. And I'll ask them, well, when you went in for your shoes, did they measure you? And they say, no, no, they asked me what size I wear. Well, the majority of them don't know what size they wear. They're already wearing a smaller shoe than what they should be. And so what the companies are, are supposed to do is actually measure them. And so what I tell everyone that's going in for a shoe, and the reason I tell you this is because you know, patients talk to y'all about this kind of stuff. You know, I'm supposed to go get diabetic shoes. Just throw it out there. Make sure that you have them measure you. And they need to measure you while you're standing. Okay? Sometimes we have to actually make a mold of the Do you have a question? Um, on these shoes here that you're passing around that made them more what people will like them. Medicare only covers certain types, is that correct? Medicare covers diabetic shoes, not for every diabetic though. So um, frequently you'll see a diabetic that doesn't have neuropathy, they're early stage, uh, maybe they're you know, 36 years old, they haven't developed all these other complications, they're not going to qualify for diabetic shoes. Um, Medicare will pay, but there are very strict criteria. They already have to have neuropathy and a callus. So your diabetic that has pretty healthy feet, they don't have any callusing, they might have a hammer toe, but they, they haven't had an ulcer yet. Those people typically <coughs> don't qualify. Okay, but if they qualify, uh -huh. does Medicare pay for only a certain type? No, it's a, there are certain shoe companies that are certified to be covered by Medicare. Okay, and so um, I'm sure there are some people out there that use clients that are not covered by Medicare, but pretty much if it's a diabetic shoe that's listed, um, as an acceptable diabetic shoe by Medicare, which is what we all carry. They're all covered. They even come with a high top boot. There's a lot of different styles. Now Medicare will cover 80%. If they have supplemental, supplemental will pick up the rest. Medicaid does not cover diabetic shoes. Is there a website for that? Um, Medicare. For, uh, for the shoes, what, what companies, what companies, what kind of shoes are covered for Medicare? Is there 
There, it's a huge list. Um, I don't know that Medicare actually has a list on their website, but any shoe, if you Google diabetic shoes, different companies are going to come up, and they have to have a certificate from Medicare. So anyone that's saying that they are they have diabetic shoes, they need to have that that certification from Medicare that they're an okay shoe, and that they meet all the criteria my in the shoe design. My mom's diabetic. These are all covered. I, that's why, except for the house shoes, there I brought some house shoes because uh, I'll talk about that in a minute. But all of the other ones, these are all styles that are covered. Now, some uh, companies that do diabetic shoes, they choose to, you know, they send you an entire shoe rack. There's probably 60 or 70 different types of shoes. Some people will choose to only offer 10 in their office. And you know they can certainly do that. And if you're not satisfied with that selection, there are other companies that do the same thing. Okay. What do you feel about sash shoes? I mean, are they? That's what I recommend for my patients that don't yet qualify for a diabetic shoe because SAS is a really good shoe. And um, I do a lot of education with my patients in shoe selection, and then it needs to have a firm sole. Um, we avoid, you know, I tell them the prettier the shoe is, the worse it is for your foot. And so if we can get a nice supportive shoe, we're doing a lot better to, as far as prevention. And SAS, I, if I send them there, I'm pretty sure they're going to get a good shoe. Lafayette, Louisiana, and they came in and they gave us an in-service, and they had all these wonderful shoes, and one of the ones that they promoted a whole lot was a style of shoe called the Fisherman Sandal. How safe do you believe that is? I can imagine what style that was. Um, it, was the, it was the Medicare shoe fitted from the whole mold of the foot from the ankle down, but it had Velcro across and two or three I would question the education that that company provided because the minority of patients require a custom molded shoe. And if they already had an example there for you, it was not no, a good No, it was yet. just something for us to see. Right, but, but at the same time, if it's a custom molded shoe, they wouldn't already have a sample because it's not molded to that patient's foot. A lot of, there's a lot of misinformation out there. There's a lot of fraud. And that's why I educate my patients because they're they're going out there. They're only entitled to one pair a year, and but so my they, concern yeah. is it was a sandal. It wasn't a closed. It probably shoe. if it was a sandal, it was not a closed shoe. It was not a diabetic shoe, not a true diabetic shoe. Okay. It might be. Um, there are some things that may be recommended for diabetics that don't already have complications. Uh, Crocs have a recommendation, but it's not a diabetic shoe. But there are a lot of sales reps out there that are selling other shoes as diabetic shoes, so we have to be really careful and make sure that we go somewhere that they're actually certified to do this. I was just curious as to why you would be wanting to promote sandals on somebody who has diabetes who exactly. is prone to foot injuries. Exactly. That's not, that's not the norm, and it's not medically recommended. And so a lot of, you know, there are a lot of fly-by-night shoe companies right now, and you'll go in there and you maybe saw that person that's a, a certified shoe fitter. Certified shoe fitter means they went to a one-day course. Um, Y'all have a seed pad right back here, Mike, and it's significantly more training. And so diabetic shoes that just come from the corner store that just set up shop and the person you just saw them working, you know, down the street in retail, the week before, they're, they're not as knowledgeable as a CPED, a podiatrist, a physical therapist, and other people that actually do diabetic so issues. this company has a podiatrist that would go out to see yeah. people, travel all over Texas, yum, 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 yeah. and do, like I say, more the mold from the foot down and build the shoe up. This was just an example. And they had 20, 30, 40 different styles of shoes, you know, right down to the house shoes and stuff. And yeah. Again, my question to them was, why are you a diabetic shoe company and doing sandals? And it was strictly because a lot of people in Texas have problems. Yes. They wear sandals, and this is the best way for you. Unfortunately, we can't control what people go out there and say, and there's a lot of misinformation. And so, as the healthcare team, it's very important that we educate the patients. Where is a good place to go? Um, 
traveling companies, I'm always a little bit leery of. I've seen prosthetic companies that will come in and offer AFOs, prosthesis, they're off the shelf. That's just, that's not a good policy to begin with. And they always have a really fantastic sales pitch. And, you know, they could sell ice to the Eskimos, but it doesn't mean that it's the way it should be. And so um, that's why, you know, I, I want y'all to know these things because patients are going out there and they just don't know any better. And then they get their Medicare uh, shoes for the year and they get a terrible pair of shoes that either don't fit or the patient has been told that they're getting a custom insert and it's not a custom insert, it's heat moldable. The difference between a custom insert and a heat moldable, this is, um, Tandis has, this is an off the shelf insert. So for your person that has never had an ulcer, they just have a callus on their foot, they're diabetic, they're neuropathic, this is the type of heat moldable insert we're going to give that patient, but it shouldn't be dispensed just like that. It needs to be heated up and molded to the patient's foot, but this is still not a custom. Now, the most common thing that I see happening right now, I order a custom insert and they, they want to go somewhere to get their shoes. We order a custom insert and they end up getting a heat moldable insert, but the company has billed for a custom molded insert. And so there's a lot of that going on. You're going to see a lot of shoe companies being shut down for these reasons. So it's very important that, so when I prescribe a custom molded insert and they want to go to such and such and get this shoe, I always let them know they should take a mold of your foot and they should measure your foot. If they're not doing those things, get up and leave and go somewhere else. So this is a heat one? That's a heat moldable. The, um, can you pull one of the inserts out of the brown shoes? The custom is actually going to fit their foot. It's actually going to be, it, it's a clear, clear difference in how that one looks. It actually fits the bottom of their foot. When you hold that insert to the bottom of their foot, it just fits like a glove. So you're and saying, see, it doesn't look like your typical insert. So you're saying not to use those at Walmart at Dr. Scholl's there where you can... Oh, the, the stand where you can stand on it and it, you know, you can go stand on that thing ten times and it's going to tell you something different every time. It really is. Sometimes I feel like going and sitting a stack of my cards by the Dr. Scholl machine. Because by the time people get to me, they've already gotten three or four pair of those. And they're not cheap either. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, you know, there's a lot of little gadgets out there. Um, on the cruise ships, they're selling what they're telling people are custom orthotics. And they're selling them for anywhere from, you know, five to $800 a pair. And it's an off-the-shelf insert. But, you know, as consumers, we just don't know other than what people tell us. And so that's why we try and educate. So, you know, if it looks kind of like, you know, it's kind of questionable, it probably is. I actually got, this is a custom. Yes. It was from one of the local. Uh, yeah, that's a custom. And, you know, those of us. I mean, I laid on a table and molded around my foot. Yeah, it's a process. It's, it's not something somebody's going to be doing out of the back of a van, you know. And there are shoe companies that literally have a van and they drive around and, you know, hang out their shingle, diabetic shoes here. And, you know, we think in our society that everything that is more convenient is the best, and it's really not. And so a custom molded insert, anything, a custom molded orthotic is definitely different than a prefab. You actually lay down on a table rather than stand yes. up on the mold. And, and the other process that happens when the when they come to see somebody who's actually trained in this, we're looking at more than their foot. We're looking at how do they walk. Because this foot looks nice right here sitting on a table, but when they get up and walk, that foot may lie differently. And so there's more going on than just, we're not shoe salesmen. We're actually fitting the patient for what they need, for what their particular problem is, and everyone's problem is different. So if you see a company that pretty much everything looks exactly the same coming out of there, there's a problem. Okay? So custom molded shoes. These are very expensive, so the thing that y'all can do when y'all see these people and they're, you know, tracking through, you know, cow manure, remind them that these, you know, cost $800 to $1,000 a pair. Take care of it because you won't get another pair until next year. You know, I think sometimes people go these other routes, people that have shoes in the back of a van, because if they have to pay $800 here, and these people are saying, well, you know, I can provide you a diabetic shoe for $150. 
They're yes. thinking, well, you know, I can't afford 800, but I can afford 150. And then they get screwed out of that 150, and she doesn't work. That's exactly right. And the other thing that I see. I'll see people that come in and they have what they're calling a diabetic shoe. It's not a diabetic shoe. They've paid $150, $200 for this pair of shoes, and the entire time they had coverage to actually get a, a diabetic shoe, a custom molded shoe. They had the insurance coverage to get what they needed. The ones that are really falling prey to these scams are Medicaid patients because they don't have any coverage at all. But most of your reputable companies will work out some sort of a payment plan with these people. Um, that's what I do. I work out a payment plan because they are expensive, but I relate it, you know, if you can afford an iPhone, then you can tuck some money back in, save up, and maybe put that on your Christmas list, ask family to help you. You know, there's a lot of ways to get to this. And I present it to all my Medicaid patients. It's, you know, I don't care where you get them. It just needs to be a good, reputable place. It's not optional. It's necessary. And I know it's not covered. I wish Medicare, I mean, Medicaid would change, but they are at this time are not. And so I just, you know, let them know that this is necessary. It's not optional. Do regular, I mean, I'm not talking about Medicare and Medicaid. What about like uh, credential, most off the wall, you know, like uh, Blue Cross and Blue Shield, before they get to the stage where they need the Medicare and Medicaid? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm not familiar. Do they have they coverage? Do Most of them do, but the policies are changing. Some policies, people are changing. Maybe they have more. Um, you can buy different. Maybe they, yeah, they have different. Maybe they, they have more eye coverage, but they don't have as much. This is called uh, durable medical equipment. They might not have as much durable medical equipment in their policy, and that depends on what their either their employer chose for their health plan or what they individually chose. Typically, um, the health plans that are very, very inexpensive don't usually have DME coverage. So that really is case by case. You know, another good area people can, can when they're working, still can opt out for like the flexible spending plan where it's tax, you know, money that you're not paying yes. taxes on, which, you know, that might be a good saving. Absolutely. And people that are really serious about taking care of their foot, as soon as I see a problem and I see that this foot is potentially going to ulcerate, and that this part that that automatically places this patient in a higher risk for amputation. So I have a real serious talk with that patient at that time. Sometimes they get very upset. Sometimes they cry. But I tell them, if we don't address this now, you will be that person out in the waiting room with one leg. And so when you put it to them that way, it seems a little harsh. But when you put it to them that way, they they have to take responsibility of learning to take care of their feet early on. If we can do that, we can slow down all of this. You know, I hate to put the wound business out out of business, but you know that's what we're all striving for. Okay. I have a, a comment to talk about insurance. I know when I first had my, I have some that comes, uh, heal up full shoe inserts just like Kathy has. Um, when I went to my podiatrist, which is the same provider, he told me that this is how much insurance going to cover, and I have had. I will have to cover the rest, yeah. and honestly, my insurance covered it pretty much. Uh, I didn't. I, whatever I paid, he reimbursed me. That's good. Yeah. They, so I mean, so yeah. I think when they call the insurance and they get the pre-certification, you know, when they actually bill, I think it's yeah. better reimbursement for the provider that he reimburses you back. It's a, it's pretty uncommon at this point that anyone's insurance is covering covering an orthotic. Um, and so we just pretty much assume they're not going to cover it because, you know, where they're making cuts in insurance, orthotics, um, DME seems to be one of the first things being cut. Mm -hmm. I, it is preventative and I don't understand it, but that's, you know, the, the way the cookie crumbles. What if you have a, a person or patient that does have hammer toes, but is not a diabetic, are they still at risk for developing those ulcers? Mm -hmm. If they ever develop a problem with their vascular flow, yes. So some of the arteria, if, if you have impeded vascular flow, then all of these pressure areas are potentially an arterial ulcer. And what so, causes people to get hematose? How do they it's a them? muscle imbalance. It's partially hereditary, partially the shoes we wear. It's really a combination of things. So you can't really necessarily prevent someone from getting them. You can always recommend at a young age that we wear better shoes. But, I mean, you've been to pay less and you see it, what uh, you can Can arthritis be a, play a factor in it? Yes. Okay. Yes, and there are, there's a, um, 
a whole group of arthritis that can, you know, worsen all these symptoms. And so, definitely. Okay, so those are our shoes. Um, the other, what I was talking about preventatively, this goes right into it. So if we take this foot, this person's already getting an ulcer here. This deformity is just not going to fit into a shoe. And so at some point, if their vascular uh, supply goes down, if they are neuropathic, this is going to be a problem. If this person is ever going to have an amputation, this is why. And so if we can catch this person while they have good circulation, while they're still somewhat compliant, as, a, as compliant as we can make anyone be, and correct this deformity, now this foot is much lower risk for any ulceration. So we can do a lot preventatively. So what did you do to go from before to after? Um, this wasn't an even my case, but what we do is straighten these toes. So usually we take a little piece of bone out of these toes. We might fuse the bones to keep them straight, depending on the type of hammer toe that it is. Um, sometimes it's a little bit dislocated at this joint, and so we'll plantar flex the toe and drive a K-wire through it. So these patients after surgery will actually have a wire sticking out of their foot that will stay in there for several weeks, and then we remove it. Um, as far as the bunion, Depending on the degree of deformity, we might have to do surgery up here. We might focus here or do surgery both places. We remove the bulk of the bone, um, create an incision completely through the bone, and move the head over. When we move the head over, the toe will straighten. Pretty cool. Yeah, it's, I mean, we can do a lot with these people when they have good circulation. We're really limited when their vascular supply goes down. Or there's, you know, they're quite a bit older, their skin is very atrophic. You just can't hardly heal that, that surgical wound. Or like in our um, people that have osteopenia, they've already got osteoporosis. As much as we're going to try and fix that, if their bone is too soft to hold a screw, that we can't do anything. We're very limited. Same thing here. These toes are just kind of, they've got a mind of their own right now. And so if we can straighten them, this foot is more agreeable to shoe gear. That's the biggest problem. If we all walked barefoot all the time, or if we were swimming all the time, we wouldn't have these problems, but we go to the store and we buy a shoe that is built for a normal foot. Well, it wasn't built for this foot, and it wasn't built for this foot, so if we can fix this early on, we can prevent more problems. Um, a couple of things that y'all might see that are more medical emergencies. Um, just like you can have a, a DVT, a blood clot, sometimes we have microemboli. And it comes down in a shower, and it just goes to all the end vessels, all the end arteries, and basically clogs up all these teeny little capillaries. And so you end up with, with this dark, uh, blotchy appearance. This person needs to see a vascular surgeon ASAP. Not next week. They really need to get in to see one, uh, someone right away. This is typically pretty painful, and so um, this is not something, you know, you might see this and say, well, we'll get them in to see someone in a week or two. They need to be seen today or tomorrow. This is a case, I had never um, dealt with calciphylaxis. I've only had one case of it. And so this pa uh, patient actually, it looked like this. But these areas were very black, very hard. Um, this was a dialysis patient. In any dialysis patient that you have, if you start seeing small, black, hard lesions on the foot, on the abdomen, anywhere on the body, and there's uh, multiple lesions, they need to be seen right away. It's calciphylaxis, um, very, very high, a high group of these people are dialysis patients. And the one patient that I have died within two days. Because all of these little emboli that are going out to the skin are going to the organs. And so... And then the, clog them, clogging them up. Too. Yes. And then you have multi-organ failure and it will kill the patient. Um, the patient that I saw Luckily, I had just finished a wound course because in residency, I never saw a case of this. And I thought, oh my gosh, is this, could this be? So we got them to San Antonio, got them to Methodist. They did everything that they could. They started amputating. Um, I think the patient had three amputations within two days and then died. And so medical emergency. Don't assume that it's nothing. It's always better to assume it is something and then it turns out to be nothing. And these, these come on very suddenly. It'll be one day it's not there, and the next day it is there, and it's painful. Um, gangrene, sometimes you're going to pull off a bandage, and a toe's going to come off with it, and 
That's dry gangrene. Two types of gangrene, dry and wet. So when we start to see parts of the foot completely become necrotic, they're dried out, they may be a little bit macerated, these are reasons that we need to get them uh, back to whoever is taking care of their wound or establish wound care or care with the vascular surgeon pretty quickly. Sometimes you'll have small areas of the toes. Um, we typically don't amputate right away because we have to see how this is going to travel. This toe is starting right here, but by the time it's all finished and demarcated, it's probably going to go up to here. So we're going to have to amputate higher. Don't you worry a lot about sepsis? Oh, absolutely. That's why we need to get these people um, into the hospital. If it's a dry gangrene, we usually don't worry about sepsis as much. You know, we, we do a full workup. But if it's wet gangrene, we immediately go in the hospital and immediately take them to surgery. Now this is a bigger case, you know, when you start seeing you've got gangrene, but you have all this macerated tissue, wet tissue, it's oozy, it's weepy, this is going to smell really bad, big problem, okay? And um, the next picture, like I said, so if the front of your foot falls off, it's real bad. <laughs> so um, the toes, you know, the, the disease that you can see with the eye is down here, but we can't create a non-weight bearing foot. We have to amputate more proximal so that we do have a good blood supply. And so that's one thing when these people, you know, they're going to say, how much are you going to take? We have to go high enough up to save what is left. Okay, so here's a different kind of a case. Y'all are going to see this multiple times throughout your career. You've got a diabetic patient. They have a red, hot, swollen foot. They don't have a wound. There's nothing draining. There's no open lesion. They don't have fever. They're completely afebrile. Labs are normal. So what do we do with this patient? So big key factor here, there's no wound. There's no signs of infection other than it's red, hot, and swollen. This is what an acute Charcot foot looks like. If you catch an acute Charcot foot, we need to immediately offload this person. That rocker bottom deformity, how many of you have actually seen a Charcot foot, the deformity? Okay, rocker bottom foot. If we can catch them in this stage, completely offload them, and that means no weight on that foot at all. We can let this disease process go through what it needs to go through. It's going to go on for a while. There's a lot of micro trauma that goes on with walking. So the nerves are sending mixed signals. So we start to send a lot of blood flow to the foot. It washes out the bones. The bones become almost like sand. So then when this patient continues to walk, it collapses. Now, wherever it collapses or whatever it position it's in, by the time this Charcot episode is over, that's how it's going to stick. That's how it's going to stay. So when you see red hot swollen foot, you can make them an appointment with their primary care, their podiatrist, ortho, whoever it is that you're going to send them to. But the number one thing is they have to be completely non-weight bearing. Because between now and the time they get that appointment, they've already walked on it, they've bottomed out their foot. Now we have a lifelong uh, deformity that will most likely lead to amputation. Okay. So this is the, the bone structure of the foot, just kind of a normal foot arch. This is how it should look. You can see the clear definition between the bones, all the joints. All of these bones are, you know, neatly defined. In a Charcot foot, it just becomes this great big ball of bone with no definition. It's just like sand, it collapses. However it collapses, that's how it's going to stay. And so that's why Charcot reconstruction is very, very involved. Um, this is um, something that is done more frequently now with Charcot reconstruction. It's very, very involved because you have to basically go in and recreate the entire midfoot of the, of the foot. And then when we do this, we create risk for another Charcot episode. And so it's, it's easier if we can catch these people before they have midfoot collapse. Okay? And then the other, the other problem with Charcot foot, once they've had an ulcer, if they have any hint of bone infection or if they ever have, they are never going to be eligible for a Charcot foot reconstruction. So it's a very difficult foot. Um, How or, long does the episode usually last? Oh, it can last three to six months or more. This, this patient needs to be prepared to be completely non-weight bearing for a long time. Very frustrating. It's very depressing. 
Um, by the end of this episode, these people are usually just a basket case because they have not been able to participate in anything. They're already depressed. Their diabetes is out of control. Maybe they were using an exercise program. Now they can't do anything, so their glucose is out of control. It's just a cascading process, and, and it's very, very sad to watch these people go through this process because they just are very depressed. Okay, and you know, when you... When you're trying to take care of yourself and then you become depressed, our chances of doing any good really go down. So we're pretty fortunate um, nowadays, you know, my residency director, when he started, they were doing Dakin Solution, Wet to Dry, and Betadine. That was basically their tool chest for wound care and amputation. And they, he told me that when he started, their goal was never to heal a wound, it was to prevent an amputation. So they just already expected that this would be a long-standing wound. We're just going to try and keep it from getting infected and save your foot. They never anticipated healing the wound. So we've really, really come full circle. Now we're preventing wounds. We're using a lot of different products so that we can heal these wounds. And so um, we use routine diabetic foot care. Dr. Armstrong uh, does a lot of research with diabetic foot infections, all these types of things. And one of the, the studies that they just published, and I don't remember the percentage, um, or no, it was the, I'm trying to remember what exactly it said. Basically, if we can get somebody in for routine foot exams, routine diabetic foot care early, the, the dollar amount that you save per patient is just as amazing. Because we're preventing amputations, we're preventing ulcers, we're preventing all these chronic problems that take this patient to a you know, non-weight bearing status. Once a patient has an amputation, odds are they're not going to live another five to seven years. So we're shortening lives when we start amputating. But if we can prevent the ulcer that started, then we can prevent this whole process. Um, we, we need to, I saw that y'all were talking about nutrition. That's perfect. Everyone has to have their nutrition assessed. Vascular status needs to be assessed. Um, control any infection that's there. Um, offloading, we most definitely have to do that. And then we have a lot of new dressings. I use a lot of skin substitutes. So if I have a wound that's not healing, hasn't closed 50% in one month, then I typically will go to a, a skin substitute. I, I use Dermagraft a lot. I use Applegraft some. And so we have a lot of tools but we need to see those patients early. Once that patient's had a wound for six months, it's harder to heal. So if we get those patients earlier, we do a lot better. And we try and make sure that we're, after we heal this wound, now we need to worry about how are we gonna keep it from coming back. So that's where we need diabetic shoes or custom molded shoes. Um, some people will need an AFO to prevent pressure on the forefoot. And so that's just a molded brace that goes completely up the patient's leg. There's a lot of devices that we can use to help these patients, but we just need to see them. And unfortunately, as much as we try and offload people, I thought this was funny. I Googled offloading and this picture came up. And so, you know, we can offload. We can give them every tool to offload, but when they're going home and they're, you know, they're offloading in their way, it's we're not getting anywhere. <laughs> so. I hope that guy's not diabetic. <laughs> okay, any questions? All right, thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Schiller. Okay, it's lunchtime and uh, we have lunch provided for you. Uh, you have the choice of either chicken or beef fajitas. They're on the side here. And just grab a box and you can come back to the table and eat or somewhere else. We can, unfortunately, we can't use a classroom back there like we did yesterday because the vendors are setting up for the product fair this afternoon. Uh, we have drinks in the back, water, and then there's sodas for 50 cents. Okay? Thank you. Oh, oh we also like to thank our sponsor today for uh, providing the refreshments. Uh, Chip O'Donnell from High Tech Rehab Solutions and also Shea Posey from Shire Region Office. And so if you see the sponsors, uh, just tell them thank you. Enjoy your lunch. And be back here.
that someone who has torn it apart, and she's taken to stall.